Okay, very good. This is, uh, again, this is Michael Brown at Bar Chart, and we'll go ahead and get going. There's still a few people logging in, uh, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, and thank you uh, for joining us for our next Commodity Insights webinar. Again, I'm Michael Brown, Head of Commodities at Bar Chart, and I'm joined again today by Darren Newsom, President of Darren Newsom Analytics. Darren has over 30 years of experience as a commodity market analyst with a focus on the grains market. Today, we're going to be talking about bar charts, commodity index, specifically for the grains market. I'm going to first set the stage by giving an overview of our proprietary indexes and the underlying cash data. And then Darren will show several examples of how he is using this data for his market analysis. We'll leave it time at the end uh, for questions. So just use the Q&A panel on the screen to submit any questions, and we'll address as many of those as possible at the end of the presentations. Okay, to get started, I just want to talk a little bit about the raw data that underpins the grain indexes. To have trusted and meaningful indexes, you must have a solid foundation of broad, deep, and clean underlying data. Our underlying grain bid data is sourced from over 4,000 grain buying locations, including elevators, terminals, processors, such as renewable fuels, producers, and others. We also have a very robust and systematic collection process, which uses an event-driven push methodology, which then allows us to capture not just end of day, but also intraday basis and price adjustments in real time. Further, we collect bids for all relevant delivery periods. We don't have just, scrap, just spot and new crop bids, but the entire forward curve up to 12 months. And lastly, we have cleaned and validated our historical data back to 2008, providing over 10 years of data for historical analysis. Okay, uh, in order to ensure the utmost in data quality and consistency, we believe it's really important, even critical, to have a well-documented and transparent methodology. Our methodology covers the sourcing and integrity of the underlying data, which is key, the processes we use to acquire and structure the data, as well as the continual data cleansing process, which is very important to good solid index. Key to usability for the indexes is understanding the calculation and weighting methodology and process to weight each of the inputs based on the storage capacity of each of the grain buying locations. Finally, the methodology covers the geographic definition and associated roll-up of each of the indexes, the delivery windows, and other important parameters such as which underlying feature the index is tied to. You can read more about our process and our methodology by going to barchart.com slash solutions and navigating to the indexes page. We'll give you a very detailed uh, breakdown of how we manage these indexes. A little bit about our grain price index coverage. We provide the industry leading coverage and granularity for the indexes. We have a set of indexes for corn, beans, and three varieties of wheat, covering again, not just spot prices, but the full forward curve up to 12 months. We also provide a continuous cash and basis chart, as well as indexes for definitive delivery periods, such as DS19, et cetera. Lastly, the indexes are available at several geographic locations, from county to crop reporting district, up to state level, regional, and even national coverage. Uh, before turning it over to Darren for a little deeper dive on uh, the use of these indexes, I just want to show a few use case examples keeping in mind that the depth and breadth of these indexes can support any multitude of different analysis your organization needs to do. 
For example, at the top is an example of comparing a regional basis differential to evaluate freight adjusted destination bids. In the chart shown up at the top, we're comparing soybean basis for both the eastern and western regions. In the second example, we're comparing corn price indexes across four counties in Iowa. In the chart on the far right is an example of evaluating an individual elevator's bid against the county average. And finally, the indexes can be useful too for comparing the movements of the cash markets relative to the futures markets, as we show for Minnesota wheat here in the bottom left chart. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Darren, turn to Darren so that he can show you real life examples of how he's using these indexes for his analysis. Darren? All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, and as Michael said earlier, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to send them in on your uh, on your toolbar uh, that you have uh, that you have on your screen. Uh, looking forward to the questions at the end. There's a lot uh, that we can do. Um, there's so much we can do with these indexes. Now. As you can see, I'm giving you a reminder here. The heart of the grain market. It looks like something from, it looks like a title from, from a greeting card. Uh, this is a reminder, if you haven't yet, there's still time today uh, to, uh, to get your significant other something. So I wanted to set that up. We have a webinar on February 14th. Couldn't miss the opportunity uh, to, uh, to remind everybody. But, but, you know, when we talk about cash, you know, the cash indexes, uh, national average cash prices, local cash prices, uh, these sorts of things. And the basis, this is the, this truly is the heart of the grain industry. And I go back a long ways, as Michael said in the introduction, uh, you know, I go back 30 years, uh, 30 years plus in this industry. And, you know, one of the things that, that I learned early when I was a, when I was a, uh, a grain merchandiser is, not about price. When you start dealing with merchandisers on up the line, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with price. It's all about basis. And so being able to track basis, being able to calculate, being able to see how it moves, uh, really is the, you know, it, it gives you the best feel for what's actually going on in the grain industry. You know, there's so many headlines, there's so much noise that we have to put up with uh, and have to fight our way through each and every day. Um, but by understanding, you know, the very basics of what drives the commercial side of the grain industry, to me, it's key. And being introduced, you know, as I've worked with Michael here for quite some time, but uh, here at Bar Chart, being, being introduced to their set of indexes, you know, the weighted indexes, the weighted averages, and these sorts of things. You know, it's just opened up a lot of doors now uh, to be able to make studies, to be able to track things. Uh, I've already been using it in presentations as I make the rounds here during the, the speaking season. So very useful tools. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into this. Uh, let, me get, uh, let me get to where I can. Okay, Michael, how do you... How do you go forward here? Uh, Check down there. Down. 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 down there. Oh, excuse me. All right, sitting normal. Okay, still not having much success. Um, pardon I'm me, okay, just a minute. Pardon me, just a minute, folks, as I try to uh, get this to work. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Michael. All right. So, uh, again, I apologize, everybody. Still getting used to some different systems here. Um, what is basis? I mean, it seems so simple. Uh, but way back when, um, a long time ago, and I know some would like to add in a galaxy far, far away, and it actually was uh, because it was back in southwest Kansas uh, where, where I started my uh, career. I was, I was just 
I'm going to say it was a young commodity broker, and I was doing a, a joint presentation uh, with a local grain merchandiser, and we were talking about markets. And all of a sudden, the question comes up from the audience, you know, what is basic? It's a very simple question. Uh, it showed that the audience was really thinking about what we were talking about. The problem was the grain merchandiser, and you know, keep that in mind, this was the grain merchandiser for a local co-op, uh, got very quiet and looked at me, didn't know the answer, uh, and wanted me to step in and, and answer this question. Now, you know, I guess what always struck me about that is that, number one, how can, it, how can the grain merchandiser not know what basis is? Again, this is the key to what a grain merchandiser does. This is the key to the grain industry as a whole is understanding basis. Uh, so I had to kind of laugh, and it's a memory that has stuck with me. And uh, as, as I study basis and as, and as I study cash markets, uh, you know, that, that's, that story, that anecdote just always stays with me and often comes to mind. Basis is today what it was then, or as I have titled here, it was then what it still is today. It hasn't changed. It's the same thing. And it is the difference between the cash price and the futures price. That's all it is. And it doesn't matter what you're looking at. If you're looking at grains, if you're looking at energies, if you're looking at livestock, basis is the difference between the cash price and the futures. Depending on where you can be, where, where you are, it might be a positive basis. It could be a negative basis. Uh, you know, as, we, as you'll see here as we make our way through the presentation, uh, there are times it can be strong, it can be weak, uh, but it doesn't change. The definition doesn't change. It's very simple. Three major components of price. It's the basis. It's the difference between cash and futures. That's all it is. That's all it ever was. Uh, and there's the equation, basis equals cash minus futures. Uh, again, if we're in the grain market industry, you just simply look. You know, if you want to know what your basis is, you look at what your cash price is. If you're a farmer out there, you look at the cash price, you subtract off the futures, it gives you basis. If you want to compare, you do that to a number of different locations, uh, and all of a sudden you've got yourself a uh, study. Or you can just look at the, uh, usually the indexes that we're talking about today and let the computer, let this system uh, do it for you. Basis is the key to any market. I mentioned the grain. I mentioned the livestock. Uh, I mentioned, I mentioned the, uh, the energy markets as well. But, you know, here over the last, I'm going to say over the last five or six years, I had the opportunity uh, to work uh, longer than that, but it changed my story here a little bit. Over in, my, in my previous life, I had the opportunity to work with probably the best, uh, the greatest livestock analyst of all time. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the livestock markets, but uh, over the last five to six years, we saw this disconnect between, uh, we saw this disconnect between the cash and the futures price. And John would say so often that the market was broken. And, you know, it's uh, when someone like him, someone with the, with the influence that he has in the market uh, says that that happens, it means there's a problem. We in the, we in the grain industry saw it Going back, uh, I believe it was around, it was late 2000, 2008, 2009, if we were watching the wheat market. You know, we saw all this, uh, all of this money flowing into commodities. Uh, we saw this incredible rally in the futures market and basis collapsed. We saw basis go, uh, to like two, two you know, over more than two dollars under, uh, for the soft red winter market. Uh, basis, was not going to go along. The cash side was not going to go along with the silliness that was happening in the future side. And the result was basis collapsed. We had to go through you know, government hearings. They set up uh, the special uh, variable storage rate program for the wheat markets to try to fix things. Uh, I'm not sure that it has. Um, I mean, if you just let markets play out, supply and demand will take care of itself. Basis plays a huge role in that. Uh, you can't dictate what basis is going to be, uh, but basis is the key. Basis was the key. Ba when you see, um, you know, a major move like that in the basis market, say it collapses like that, there is something wrong. On the other hand, when you see basis skyrocket, it always tells us 
one of the things that tells us that there's a short supply situation and folks are scared. They're not being able to cover demand needs. So basis is the key. And again, it doesn't matter if we're talking about livestock grains, whatever it might be. It's that difference between. It's that connect. It's that differential between the cash and the futures market that really tells us what's going on, um, you know, behind the curtain, uh, outside of the shine of the spotlights and so on. Um, good friend. I've had the opportunities to uh, present with him over the years. Young analyst, uh, but he's been in the business you know, his entire life. Uh, and, and he and I have done a lot of presentations together. And he has this great rule. He calls it his golden rule. Something that he was taught uh, in the industry and something he presents on all the time. And that is basis, then spreads, then futures. And if we think about it, that's how things play out. The basis moves first. And so if we're tracking basis, if we're, if we're doing all of these studies to keep an eye on what's going on in the basis and we're trying to, you know, juggle two, three, four locations, whatever it might be, or maybe we're just looking at national average basis and these sorts of things, uh, we'll usually see some sort of move in basis first and then the spreads. What are spreads? That's the price difference between the futures contracts themselves. Those of you familiar with my analysis know that's how I look at fundamentals. I don't pay... Uh, I pay as little attention to USDA reports as possible, EIA reports and the energies, you know, livestock reports, anything like that. I try not to pay much attention to it because the spreads and bases tell me all I need to know about fundamentals. And then after we see basis and spreads move, then the futures start to move. Now, uh, tomorrow I, I have a column that's going to be going up on my website that talks talks about something similar to this, and it's what we're seeing in soybeans right now. We'll go into it here in a little bit where there is a disconnect between what's happening in the futures market and what's happening with these fundamental indicators, including basis, national average basis. And the bottom line is, yes, basis, then spreads, then futures. But the thing to remember when we're talking about when we start to see these divergences and we're waiting for that third piece of this to happen when we're waiting for the futures markets to to do what the fundamentals are indicating the thing to remember is fundamentals will win eventually the fundamentals the tendency is for the futures market to move back in line with the fundamentals not the other way around you're not going to see basis and spreads all of a sudden change usually you're not going to see them change to get back in line with what's going on in the futures market normally what happens is the futures come back to reality and go the directions of what uh, basis and spreads are telling us. So important to remember the simple rule, basis, then spreads, and futures. It lays out perfectly the most important aspect, uh, again, the key to any market. So bottom line, all that being said, basis is the heart of the grain industry. It's what merchandisers trade. It's what sets the tone. It's what it's kind of the judge and jury of what will ultimately happen in a market. And that is basis. Is it strong? Is it weak? Um, you know, if it's one or the other, it tells us so much about supply and demand and so on. Uh, you can read so much into basis and having good cash indexes, weighted average cash indexes allows us to create so much, so many studies. Uh, that help us in understanding what the overall situation is. Uh, and this, okay, this is true for cash grain trading, true for hedging, and so on. Okay. Now, here is a look at the national average corn basis. Okay, this is a study uh, that I look at a lot. Um, you know, I check it. I have it set up on weekly. Uh, but I check it every day. Uh, I look for small changes and so on. And what we see here is very interesting to me. If we look back at December and we see that we had a little bit of run up uh, during the fall and then it fell back off uh, in December as we rolled, we're getting ready to roll from the beast to March contract. Um, what we see is that since December up through Today or this week, we've seen corn bases continue to strengthen. The cash market has continued to gain on the futures market. 
And it's interesting because we have this sixth crop in a row. In both corn and soybean here in the U.S., we've had six record crops in a row. And I don't mean each crop has been bigger than the last, but if you take them as a group, they're the six largest producing years that the U.S. has ever seen. And saying that, we've seen supplies continue to increase. If we've got that situation, the natural inclination would be basis should be getting weaker. We should be seeing a very weak basis. That's not the case. And I'll show you here another chart here in a little bit, something that I've created using the index. So what we can see here is that there is something going on in the supply and demand. We've got good demand. Maybe it's nothing more than that supplies are locked up tight over the course of the winter because of one polar vortex. I don't know what the weather's like where you are. Uh, it's getting cold here in Omaha. We've got the wind howling outside. Uh, we know we've had polar vortexes moving across the northern plains or plains in general uh, in the Midwest over the last two or three weeks. Uh, it's just been cold and nasty outside. It's February. That's the way it's supposed to be. But what happens is though you know the cash drain, the, the cash corn that's being stored, and with the quarterly stocks report that we just saw at the uh, the January quarterly stocks report that just came out uh, a week ago, uh, showed us we still have a large number of stocks on on farm uh, as of December one. So those are locked up tight. There's not a lot of movement. You're not seeing farmers go out and willingly un start to unload those bins in this type of weather. So what happens is demand continues to pull, supplies are tightening up, basis continues to firm. And we can see that, again, by looking at the national average. And this just takes, uh, this just takes the national corn index, and right now, subtracting off the March futures contract. So very simple, tells us a lot uh, about what's going on in the market. Okay. Uh, again, national average basis again shows us the overall domestic supply and demand situation. We can we can narrow this down as as Michael talked about. We can go down to the county level. A, a presentation I just gave uh, a week or so about a week ago in Ohio. You know, I was able to show them their what what the county basis has been doing. They knew, but I was able to show them in chart form how it how it can compares to you know the previous months and so on. So that you know I was able to graph you know on the graph I was able to show them that and that was very handy. So you can you can go from the telescopic view down to the microscopic view and it's a great thing. Uh, so it, it, as when we're talking about the national average basis, it does show us the overall domestic supply and demand situation. It's very important to know. As, a, as an analyst who looks at things big picture, that's why you know that's what I like to look at. I like to look at the national, I like to look at the overall situation. Um, next one here is, um, oh, excuse me, there was, that was supposed to be one before. Again, I use the national average basis studies more than any other basis, and that is for now, because I think we're going to see some changes. I think some of the local basis level, local basis bids and local basis charts uh, are going to start to get pretty interesting as we move out of spring. That's when you're going to start to see some more Converge to start to happen on the regional and local level uh, as some of those markets start to heat up as well. Um, we can use the index and the data. We can pull the history. Uh, as Michael talked about, we can pull the history of the index, uh, again, national, local, regional, whatever you want to do, and we can start to build seasonal studies. We can start to build all kinds of studies. The ones I prefer are the seasonal studies, the tendencies. It shows the normal flow of supply and demand over the course of a 12-month year in grains. I look at marketing years, energies. I look at calendar years, and so on. So, and again, it represents the overall general market supply and demand and market fundamentals. The other thing that basis helps us do and it's what I talked about before with the wheat and what we've seen in the cattle and so on, is that when you start to get these huge divergences between the futures and the cash market, when basis just collapses, it's a great indicator of a market bubble. You know, the wheat situation is classic uh, in that we did not hold the futures up there. Uh, it collapsed. 
uh, a few years ago, we saw crude oil do much the same thing. We saw we saw crude oil futures, you know, at 140. They were, you know, everyone was talking about 150. We had a two dollar uh, carry in the future spread. We had a big difference in we had a, in the basis uh, was weak between ca- you know between cash crude oil and uh, and futures. Where we ended up that year, we ended up down around 30 bucks. So basis also helps us to spot market bubbles and but also very important tool very important use for basis and cash in again the late 2000s in the wheat market now here's a study that i've built and this goes back four years uh, michael said that we now have index data uh back to 2008 so i'm looking forward to getting my hands on that and, and uh, lengthening out some of these studies but nevertheless it still shows us uh, what we can do. And, and what I've done is I've built seasonal indexes uh, or seasonal patterns or a seasonal study uh, for a national average coin basis. And I've done it by comparing, you know, what's the strongest we've seen basis over the last four years, what's the weakest we've seen basis over the last four years, and what's the average that we've seen over the last four years. And again, if we look at the green line, and we can, you know, this this marketing year's uh, basis, and we compare it, and, and we compare it to those parameters, we can see that right at harvest, when this enormous production was rolling in, uh, we were down near the lows of the last four years. We were down about 47, 48 cents under national average. We didn't stay there very long. Though, think back to that first chart that I showed. How since then we've been moved, we've seen basis continue to firm to the point where now we're sitting at like uh, 27, 28 under, and that's stronger than the four year average. So we've got something going on. We don't necessarily have to know what exactly, but what, you know, but what it shows us is, is that, again, supply is, has tightened up, demand remains firm, maybe not as strong as what we need it to be, but demand is certainly firm. And the two of those combined here over the course of the winter has helped us see a stronger than usual, stronger than normal move in corn basis. Now, what's it do from this point? If we look at the average and we look at the weakest that it's been, we tend to just go stagnant. Not unusual for the corn market to go stagnant and then start to head lower into harvest. Uh, as we get into late summer, early fall next year, or this coming year. Uh, but for right now, it's been very impressive. So producers who are holding their, you know, who have protected their grain with short hedges, say in the December, and those have been rolled to the March and so on, they're still holding them in March. They can be looking at this and saying, okay, is this time, is, is there's a study like this using the National Average Indexes, uh, does this show me that it's time to pull the tr- trigger on this cash? Uh, what can I expect basis to do? Well, if I'm looking at these charts, I'm not expecting it to do much of anything from here on out. I'm not, you know, maybe we could take a little bit of advantage in, what, in, the, in the carry that's still in the forward curve, but there's not a great deal. So this could be that opportunity that we've been looking for, that we've been waiting for. It played right into our or Hansen would tell that the possibility was there back last fall because of how the index data built these studies. Or we built these studies using the index data and what it shows us. So from a producer point of view, you know, it's certainly waving flags saying, hey, this could be the opportunity. Now, if we wanted to do a little more local, let's say we wanted to look at our county or we wanted to look at a region, we could do the same sort of thing, collect the data, you know, run all the numbers as far as you know, what's the you know what's the string of highs been for the last four years, five years, whatever it might be, the lows, so on. And how do we sit in relation to all those? Because again, we're still dealing with a lot of corn. So, local, regional, national, whatever you want to use, this could be your opportunity. And this is how you build it. This is how you use the data associated with these indexes. Uh, that Michael was talking about. Okay, national average cash indexes. Uh, again, cash, and now this is just the cash indexes themselves. We talked a lot about basis, but now let's go into the cash indexes. Cash price, again, is the second component of that key equation 
Again, basis equals cash minus futures. So we want you know, we want to know what the cash price is. The merchandiser, all it did really was was the result of what the basis was. But you know, if I'm a producer or if I'm traders, whatever it might be, I really want to know what the cash market is. I want to know what the cash price is. Um, and these weighted averages give us a better representation of national average cash price. There's a lot of cash indexes out there. These are the first ones that I've been able to use <coughs> that actually are a weighted average. In other words, a small elevator out in the middle of, let's say, northwest Kansas in a non-weighted index has the same weight, has, you know, affects the average, the index price, just as much as, say, a huge elevator in the middle of Illinois or in the middle of Iowa. Take your pick. In Des Moines. It doesn't work that way. You know, if you if one facility is moving two, three, four million bushels a year, and the other one might be two, three, four thousand, I want to know what the price is of the two, three, four million. That's going to have that's a better reflection of the overall market. So the weighted average allows for that. And so the two, three, four million uh bushel facility is going to carry more weight. It's going to be a better reflection. It's going to leave a bigger footprint, I guess, is the is the way to say it these days. And that's what I like about using these averages because I have a feel. It gives me the feeling that, you know, I am getting a better representation of what the national average cash price really is. Uh, and to me, you know, over the last 30-some years, I've, I've studied cash prices a lot. Why? Because again, it's the intrinsic value of a market. We can see futures do what they do. Uh, and back in the early days, shortly after the 2000, the, the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005 and the, C and the CFTC uh, and CME changes in position limits uh, of 2006, we saw futures go haywire. And, you know, we saw these huge rallies in the grain futures in the sector. And, you know, what was the actual value? How did, how did we know what the intrinsic value was? We saw a lot of problems with cash grain forward contracting. I've talked about the situation in wheat, this, that, and everything else. It came down to the intrinsic value. What was the intrinsic value of the market? And that was the cash price. You know, that's what the market was actually willing to pay. We saw all kinds of systems get blown up. Uh, as the futures did what they did. And we've seen it again, not only in grains, but in livestock and cotton and so on. Um, but if we always tie it back to the intrinsic value, we can we can keep a better feel, we can have a better feel for what the reality of the situation is and what we really should be trading, particularly if we're trying to trade cash grade. Let's look at an example. Uh, this is <clears throat> the national average hardware winter wheat price. Uh, Again, national average for U.S. hard red winter. And we see that it's right around 460, uh, 460 and a quarter, if you want to call it. Not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, you see we've gone up a little bit. We've kind of flattened out and back down uh, from the highs that we saw last summer. So the intrinsic value, the national average cash price, looking at uh, hard red winter wheat, is 460. Okay? Um, but we can take this down to local and regional cash indexes as well. So we can start to compare. As Michael said, we can start to look for these opportunities uh, that may not necessarily be in our region. By comparing the local and regional, it allows comparison, again, uh, of any market back to the national market. We can compare one region or locality to another. You know, and in this day and age of Everyone seems to have semis or, or access to semi freight. Uh, we can start to move our grain to different regions, to different localities. If the basis is strong enough, it's different enough from what we're being, from what we're seeing in our own local region, locality or region. Uh, and we can take advantage of that. We have to figure in the freight. Yes, I understand that. 
uh, you know, and all these things. But we can measure that. We can we can evaluate it using these indexes, uh, the, the, so the wide variety of indexes that we have available to us right now, and we can look for those opportunities because in when it when the industry is is going through a tough time like it is right now, every little penny, every nickel, every dime that you can find certainly helps. And there are areas that tend to pay more. Then you know, if you can get your grain there, it might work for you. If you can't, then you have to make your local situation work best, again, by studying the seasonality, knowing when things move, that sort of thing. So you know, these indexes are uh, extremely valuable. Use. So now, what I'm doing, recall that uh, the national index was about 460, okay, for hard red winter wheat. Going back to my home base of Edwards County, Kansas, you know, it used to be, uh, growing up, it was, it, was, it was a wheat area. You know, we grew a lot of hard red winter wheat down there. I remember the harvest well. Again, I worked for the co-ops and so on. It's been, you know, like everything else here in the United States, it's largely switched over to the corn and soybeans, but... Uh, I guess, uh, you know, again, this being uh, February 14th, uh, you know, looking at the, you know, the remote romance of yesterday, uh, you know, thinking back. So let's compare, let's, let's take a look at what the Edwards County County average price index is uh, and compare it to the Reno County. And Reno County is in the center of the state. For those of you not familiar with Kansas, uh, it's one of the two key counties in of Reno and Central County. This is in the center of the state. Large terminals in Hutchinson, one of the largest elevators in the United States, uh, sits there uh, in in Hutchinson, Kansas. So, you know, we've got we can, we can now check to see. Okay, for about four about four fifty uh, is the local cash price in Edwards County. Four eighty is the price in uh, in Reno County. It's about seventy miles. Can we ship, can we move our wheat from Edwards County to Reno County and make a profit? I would say yes. And when I was merchandising, this is what I was looking for. You know, these are the bids that I was looking for. Okay, so I would compare Reno versus Sedgwick and all these other things uh, up to Saline County. We'll see that in a minute. And I would look for my best opportunity. So if I'm a merchandiser sitting out in southwest Kansas and I can say, okay, I've got 30 cents. I can I can do thirty cents better by shipping to Reno County. I'm certainly going to consider it. If I'm needing to move out some wheat to make room for some other stuff, let's say I'm trying to pick uh, Milo up off the ground still here in February, and I need to move some wheat up to make some room. Yeah, I'm going to be looking at these indexes. I'm going to be tracking them, and I'm going to see. Okay, this is widened out to about thirty cents. There's more demand right now in Reno County than there is in Edwards County. So. We simply just move it there. We start to, you know, we track it, we find it, and we move it. We make the sale and we move it. Um, now, let's add another terminal facility. Let's go up to Salina or Saline County. And we notice that where Reno County was 480, now we see Saline County is 484. And we're still right around 450. Well, I might be able, and that's like 80, 90 miles up to uh, Saline County, up to Salina, there's another four cents on the table. Take it. Use it. Use these indexes. Track these indexes. Uh, and again, build your seasonal, uh, build your seasonal studies to be able to say, okay, at what point do these, do these uh, indexes all start to move against each other or with each other and come together and move apart and all sorts of things. Uh, but here it shows us from a merchandiser point of view. If I'm a producer, actually not many producers hold their own wheat on farm, but there are some, and I see this, I see the opportunity, the opportunity to get something done in here. So, again, very useful. Something that I haven't found uh, before is being able to drill down to the county, to the local county uh, level, and actually start looking for opportunities. It's very exciting, as you can tell by the way I'm talking. Uh, you know, if I'd had this when I was merchandising, I'm not going to say it would have made me a good merchandiser because I was always interested in the trading side, but it certainly would have been an extremely handy tool uh, to use. Okay, so 
We can look at a national index, we can look at local indexes, we can look at regional indexes. We can compare the indexes from one region to another. But what about time frames? Michael mentioned that you can look at the entire spectrum of the forward curve uh, and look for, <coughs> they have indexes for each one of the months. So what can we do with this? We can show spot indexes uh, that show price and basis for immediate delivery, and we can compare that to deferred indexes showing price and basis for later months. Uh, and this is this is very useful if I am a farmer, let's say I'm in the Midwest, more of a corn soybean farmer in the Midwest, and I do have you know those bins that the that the recent quarterly stocks report said are just chock full of grain, particularly soybeans, uh, at this time. I can start looking for the opportunities. Maybe I'm still locked into a, you know, I could, I could compare all these different local, localities and regions, but now I can look for the best time frame. Um, you know, let's say we're looking right now at spot soybean, and I want to compare it to April. And why do I choose April? Because, you know, that's after South America's harvest becomes a known entity. Right now it's still kind of up in the air, uh, but we know more about what it is. The South American harvest is actually going to be, um, and how does that weigh? Does it weigh on our local market? And if so, is it more along the ports and the port markets, or does it work its way all the way up into the Midwest? You know, we can track all, all of those things with these different time frames. Uh, again, with the growth of the on farm storage, not only can we look for the best market opportunity, but we can look for the best time frame uh, where basis is being bid as well. Okay, uh, what I'm looking at here <coughs> is Central Illinois. Uh, I believe I picked up uh, Decatur, uh, actually, you know, in the, in the Decatur area. And so here I'm comparing, uh, I'm comparing just price. Uh, I'm looking at the national average and uh, Decatur price. Oh, excuse me, no, that's not what I'm looking at the Decatur price now, the spot bid, and the April bid. And what's interesting. The cash price itself, going out just to the third month, is there's not much difference. It's about the same. And and as I told Michael when I was putting these slides together and I said to him, I was actually expecting something different. And this is the fun in doing these things and, and comparing these different time frames is that in this instance, in this region, in this locality, there wasn't much difference. There wasn't much difference in cash. But yet there was a little bit of difference in the basis. So what we're seeing here then is the reflection of what's going on in the futures market as well. Here we see basis of 51 and three quarter under versus about a 64 cent under. So let's just call it 52 and 64. So there's a 12 cent carry in the basis. That means that brings cash prices pretty close together. So if I was just looking at selling cash, you know, I could sell for the same cash price now or later. Or if I'm going to try to play basis and I'm holding on to, say, a May futures hedge, what I'm betting on then is that that deferred basis is going to come back up to where uh, the old crop basis is right now. So we'll see that 12 cents made up. Will it happen? I don't know. You know, that's where a seasonal study for Central Illinois would certainly come in handy, where you could certainly build such a thing, see what the seasonality is. Right now, we've got about a 12 cent difference in basis. Cash prices are about the same. Cash is saying, you know, no need to sell it out that far unless you've already got a hedge, unless you're already rolled out to May. Uh, you've rolled from the March to the May. Maybe you've rolled on out to the July. I don't know. Uh, but if you've rolled on out to the May, now you've got an opportunity to see if that basis starts coming up. I would be a little bit concerned looking at this basis chart, again, going back to just trends. Uh, you know, there hasn't been, I guess, a lot of movement in the deferred basis, uh, but it's also not indicating that it wants to do, you know, wants to change uh, change course and start heading back up to where uh, the spot basis is at this point. Could happen, uh, certainly, you know, if we look at the national average, uh, we do national average basis. We do don't have a chart with me right now, but it certainly does show that we can see some strength here over the spring. Uh, but I'd be a little bit concerned. Again, looking at those cash prices would certainly give me an indication that, you know, maybe it's just something that I want to go ahead and sell now. 
uh, if I, or at least sell a little bit of it now. So again, a lot of uses for these things. Uh, I'm doing some analyzing while I'm sitting here in front of you looking at these charts. So uh, it's fun to do. Uh, you know, it's fun to build these different scenarios and these indexes certainly give us the opportunity to do that. Last but not least, um, something that I find very handy, and, and, and rather than being last, often this is where I go to first, and that is the basis map. And you can see hot spots, cold spots, and so on. And, uh, you know, right now, if you look out to the western corn belt, you know, northern plains, western corn belt, you see that that's where the weakest basis is. Yet, I don't, I don't have it on this map, but yet the, the Pacific Northwest basis, uh, rail basis is just skyrocketing right now. It hasn't moved back to the local basis of the western corn belt at this point. We'll have to see if it does. Again, I think it has more to do with the fact supplies are locked up tight rather than this explosion in demand. But if you start at this basis map, you can get an overall sense of, you know, where the market's strong, where it's weak. And then you start to piece everything together from there. So, again, this was my last slide on basis, but it could also be your first starting point. Uh, and, again, easy to find, easy to look at. A lot of information on this one uh, on this one map. Okay, that does it for my part. Um, I'm going to jump in and see how many questions have come in for either Michael or myself. Uh, oh, sorry, Michael. I guess I need to change this over to you. Uh, I already, I've already got it, Jeremy. You've already got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, quick, quick question. Uh, uh, that came in, yeah, or, sure. or really more. More of a, a request for, for clarification for some of the folks. Um, when you talk about uh, basis strengthening or weakening, yep. from whose perspective is that? And can you maybe clarify a little bit about you know what you mean by strengthening basis or weakening okay. basis? What I mean by strengthening or weakening is in relation to the futures. Uh, you know, a lot of people say good or bad or, or lots of other things. But to me, if I go from a 50 under basis, like I did uh, at, the, at the beginning of corn harvest last year, if I go from a 50 under basis to a 30 under basis, that means that the cash is 20 cents closer to the futures market than it was when we started. The basis has strengthened. The basis has firmed. I like to use stronger and weaker basis. Let's, let's, take, let's take soybeans, for example. If we were to go from... 60 under to 90 under. That's a weaker basis. So, you know, it, to me, it's all in relation to the futures market, excuse me, the cash price to the futures market. Now, let's flip that to those areas where we actually have a positive basis. Let's say we start at 20 over and we're now at 40 over. That's stronger because, again, it's moving away. It's strengthening in relation to the futures market. Cash market's strengthening in relation to the futures market. But if we start at 20 cents and we go down to par, let's say we drop down to par, then we've seen cash weaken in relation to futures. So we've got a weaker basis. That's how I look at it. You know, a lot of places, a lot of people use different terms. I've always tried to use stronger, weaker. Uh, when I talk about basis movements, and it's cash price in relation to futures. Okay, very good. Um, another question that came in was, how do I get my hands on these indexes? And uh, there's two ways today. Uh, one is through our Commodity View desktop platform. We talked a lot about this in our last uh, webinar, so I won't go into detail here. But uh, this is a, a brand new uh, modern technology, all HTML5 and jam-packed with not only you know, futures prices, news, weather, charting, but also all of our proprietary data like the cash bid prices and the indexes that we've talked so much about today. So that, that's one way to get uh, your hands on this information and do some of the same analysis uh, that Darren and I were showing you. And the second way is that it's also available uh, via an API or a data feed. So if you need to, uh, you know, use this data in a risk management system or an accounting system or use it for a more in-depth internal analysis. Uh, it is available in raw form via the API as well. 
Okay. Michael, um, I do want I do I'm sorry, did I cut you off there, Michael? Nope, you go right ahead. All right, I wanted to I wanted to touch base on another comment that came in that ties back to the first question that was asked me, and this is a great comment. Uh the the attendee says uh, Holstein basis, talking about Holstein cattle. Holstein basis has been terrible in recent years. Again, going back to the overall, you know, divert, you know, price related, the break in price relationship between cash, uh, and, uh, and futures, uh, when we come to cattle, even though there's no, mess, not necessarily a, uh, Holstein futures market, but it, it moves off of the live and feeder cattle market. Uh, Holstein basis has been terrible in recent years. At one time, I could get minus five to minus eight basis, all right, uh, for Holstein contracts. Today, they are minus 15 to minus 18. So if we go back to the de definition of weaker or stronger, if we've gone from minus 5 to minus 8 uh, in relation to the cash market, uh, cash, excuse me, in relation to the futures market, and now we're at minus 15 to minus 18, we've moved farther away, we've weakened the basis by you know a, ten, a good $10. So again, speaks to not only the first question, which was a great question, by the way, uh, you know, what does, you know, define strong, strong and weak, but it also goes back to the idea that we can break these markets and the intrinsic value of any market remains the cash price and that makes basis, you know, again, the heart, not just of the grain industry as I, as I talked about, but cattle, energy, whatever, whatever market we want to be looking at. Okay, very good. Thank you, Gary. That, uh, that helped a lot. Um, okay, I think that's uh, about uh, the end of that presentation for today and, and the questions and answers. Um, I do want to just mention one other thing before we leave. Uh, Bar Chart is hosting a new conference in Chicago this year called Commodity Exchange. Uh, it's a one of a kind event, totally focused around uh, the grains market and really uh, about the, you know, the explosion of data in agriculture and how that data and new technologies are impacting the commodities market. It's going to be held, as I said, in Chicago, uh, really the capital of commodities trading. Um, when? After it warms up. Uh, you want to go to <laughs> Chicago or Minneapolis currently. And it's going to be May 8 to 10. Uh, and it's going to be just a very timely and relevant discussions and presentations uh, around you know those those topics, the data and the technology impacting the grains markets, uh, and a great chance to network uh, with your peers. We expect uh, five to six hundred uh, attendees for that, uh, very much centered around uh, you know grains, grain trading, uh, hedging, uh, hedge funds, uh, etc. Uh, to sign up, uh, you can go to barchart.com solutions and navigate your way to the commodity exchange page. Uh, and click on register and sign up there. Uh, one benefit of attending today's webinar is that if you use promotion code webinar, uh, the fees for the event will be waived. So it's a, it'll be a, a free event for you. So with that, uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. Uh, hopefully it was uh, useful and beneficial information. And if you have any, any questions uh, at all, you can follow up with myself, Michael Brown, at mbrown at barchart.com or my number there in the bottom left of the screen or with Darren Newsom at Darren Newsom Analysis. So again, thanks very much and that concludes our presentation for today. <laughs>